Chapter 5 An Added Faculty of Perception In the foregoing pages, I have maintained not only that Jesus was a mystic, and that only mysticism could adequately explain both his life and his teaching, but also that Nietzsche, for all his rapier mind and his many attacks on mysticism, was nevertheless pretty much a mystic himself. And these two men have been my chief teachers and inspirers. Moreover, from at least 1920 until 1940, my life was centered and rooted in my mystical experience. Through all of 20 years, I picked my way through the most delicate, difficult, and far-reaching decisions of my own life by an expansion of inner vision and an inner compelling force that I freely called mystical then, and even after years of the most searching skeptical scrutiny, freely call mystical still. It is time, therefore, that I make it clear what to me mysticism is. This is all the more necessary because the mystic today is out of favor. The great bulk of the scientists who so largely give our society its tone quite evidently believe that the mystic's experience has little if any social value and that his interpretation of his experience is as unsound as his generalizations on the basis of it are loose. And probably most other thinking men see in him a victim of self-deception, running away from reality. Even organized religion looks at it coldly and suspiciously. The Catholic Church, to be sure, has preserved the tradition, but only in spots. And though the Quakers also have the tradition, they now generally keep their mystical experience so consistently and safely within the bounds of respectability, practicality, and general ordinariness that one can hardly believe it any longer possesses much vitality or significance. For the most part, organized religion, like everything else in our Western world today, bows the knee only to reason and materialism. Indeed, at my own hands too, mystics and the mystical have come in for a good deal of criticism. For example, much that is said against them in Professor James H. Luba's Psychology of Religious Mysticism, written from a strictly rationalistic and avowedly atheistic point of view, seems to me entirely justified, especially as regards that brand of them who were too frothy in their emotions or too morbid in their self-mortification, and those whose ecstasies, the women's with Jesus, and the men's with the Virgin Mary, are only too obviously an etherealization of the very sexual instinct they abhorred and deluded themselves into thinking that they had escaped. But it is only fair to note, one, that most of the mystics whose experience Luba examined were of precisely this neurotic, neurasthenic, and socially inconsequential and useless type, and two, that the really great mystics received little or no attention. There was a time, however, when I was as naive as the rest of them. During the nine-year period, when I lived the life of a freelance Franciscan, what spoke within me, to be sure under certain recognized and definite conditions, I accepted as, and frankly called, the voice of God. And to this, I tended to pass all responsibility. I myself was but a soldier under orders. As such, my whole obligation was to do faithfully what I had found myself commanded. If people did not like things I did, my inclination was to tell them that they should present their objections not to me, but to God. In the fall of 1929, however, this kind of life in me began to break up. There then intervened that period of devastating skepticism, of which I have written in a previous chapter. It was a time of strong resurgence on the part of my reasoning mind, I doubted everything that I had once so firmly believed. I questioned even those assumptions on which had rested my sense of peace and security in the face of the universe, my certainty of direction in life, and all the position of influence among the men that had come to me through nine years of strenuous experience. I asked what men knew or had ever known or could know about this universe in which our lot is cast about any ultimate reality or any absolutes? What reason was there to think that the yardstick of our human values had any reference to such things? Where was the evidence that the universe was rational or had a purpose, or was guided and permeated by love, in particular, by any special love towards man? 
What was the evidence of the moral order in the universe that the preachers loved to talk about? To be sure, for ages, men have talked about these things as though they were sure, as though certainty were not only possible, but actually achieved. They had even declared that God, by which I suppose whatever else they mean, they mean ultimate reality, was spirit infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. They have talked about God, and to this day, they talk about him. They talk about him in the churches and everywhere, not only thus in general, but more in particular, about the plan of God for salvation, even about the plan of God for the salvation of China. They talk about him as though they had hobnobbed with him since they were schoolboys together, talk about him until I grow nauseated with the hearing of their talk. And now, when they begin, there commonly arises in my mind the picture of two bullfrogs pulling themselves at daybreak from the depths of their little pool, which was the only world they really knew, and lifting themselves up onto their hind legs and with an air of great wisdom discussing together why the sun comes up and what it is and whither it goes, as though they ever could know. And what more can man know about ultimates and absolutes? These big words he uses to talk about them, infinite, eternal, unchangeable, truth. What are they but a means by which man hides, even from himself, the fact that he does not know about such things and cannot know about them, that knowledge about such things simply is not given to man? Most men believe because without believing they could not live. They would go into a panic at the thought of undertaking amidst uncertainty all around them to make sure of their course in life by a certainty and a strength that they found only inside themselves. Their beliefs about ultimates are an unconscious device by which they hide the inscrutableness of existence from their own eyes and hide from themselves also the fact that they are hiding, the fact that they are afraid and weak and are running for cover. But my search for reality was pitiless. I was willing, I thought, to pay any price. I wanted no fool's paradise, nor any saints. I could not stand the thought of buying peace at the cost of honesty. My search might lead me to a region where life would be more austere and more stark. That I should not mind. But if there were, amidst the shifting sands of human existence, any rock that so ran down into the very foundations of the universe that it could be counted on to withstand any storm that all the fury of the elements might hurl against it, then I wanted to find it. Was it to be found in the mystical experience? So, now this also came under my critical eye. I had read some psychology, I now read more. I was resolved that my mind should be free to examine and to criticize any side whatever of my total experience. So now I gave it free reign with the mystical. I ventured to look behind the scenes. I undertook to separate the raw stuff of my experience from any interpretation that I might have upon it. Admittedly, there had long been that within me which, in the deepest stillness of my being, always spoke to me, and in the face of any situation, told me very explicitly just what I should do. But I said to myself, what is this that is spoken? If it is not God, what is it? And what value does it have, or reliability, or authority? Thus I asked myself, and this asking, and the thinking I did in consequence, had its effects. I suppose for one thing, I am somewhat less of a mystic than I might have been. This thing of pulling up your roots to examine them is not entirely wholesome, but being the kind of man I was and living in an age like ours in which every value, standard, and practice is being challenged, criticized, experimented with, and more or less widely rejected, until there is almost no certainty left, I simply could not afford to go on building my house without subjecting the soundness of my foundations to every test within the reach of my capacities and my resources. And this test I made. I had to make it. And I am glad that I made it. I may be less of a mystic than I might have been, but my having made sure of the ground under me may enable another man to go farther than I can now. And in any case, 
What mysticism I have, I am sure of. I may not be flying so high, but there is less chance of my being brought down altogether. I already have faced the worst. I have no reason to fear light, any light. There is nothing at which I am afraid to look full and straight. Prove to me that what is commonly called God does not exist. Ultimately, it would not disturb me. I believe that I am prepared at any time to cast all that I need to say about the mystical experience into terms of psychology. Moreover, let me add that even now I rather avoid using the word God for the simple reason that to different people it has such vastly different meanings that there could be no certainty about what people would be taking me to be saying. But let no reader of mine on this account take it into his head that I am an atheist. If he could but peer into my heart and sense the communion there between my innermost being and that which is beyond all words, he would perhaps realize that I have within me the counterpart of all God that any man ever has had as a matter of his own first-hand experience. In short, if there was any one thing that came through the fires of my prolonged skepticism more unscathed than any other, it was my mystical experience. I believe that in this a man comes nearest to bedrock that human existence can reach. Here he can find what will create rock and give him firm footing amidst and through any situation whatever. Where everything else is uncertain, he can be certain in himself. And though my understanding of the experience is now quite different, and although I claim for what speaks in the deepest stillness of my being neither absoluteness nor infallibility. Nevertheless, what spoke to me before speaks to me still, and now, as before, I undertake to obey it as implicitly as a child. For reasons that I shall state in due time, I undertake to obey it as though it were both absolute and infallible, even though I definitely believe it to be neither. In short, the mystical experience remains the center of my life. For me, it is not a device by which to escape from reality, but the best means by which any man may see quickly and surely what he should do in the world so that he can do it with all his powers. I hold to it not for any agreeable feeling that may accompany the experience, but for the more sustained and consistent certainty that it brings and for the greater wholeness that it leads toward. Even in its simpler manifestations, I see it as a means to personal integration, direction, and increased power. It may be that my kind of mysticism will be accepted neither to the mystics nor to the scientist. To the scientist, I am not scientific, and to the mystics, I am hardly a mystic. Then so be it. I do not find it necessary to be acceptable to anybody. It is enough that it be acceptable to me. It has given me that by which I believe I am able really to live, which is a good deal more, perhaps, than can be said for most of the scientists with their science. However, and be all that as it may, it is time now for me to try to state what I mean by the mystical, and what I do not mean. I do not mean the psychic. The psychic relates chiefly to the perception of phenomena essentially of a sensory order, even though without the aid of senses. It may also relate to the non-sensory communication of thought. It brings us experiences that reach us ordinarily only through the five senses, and which are not beyond what could reach us and have reached us through these senses. Even when, as in so-called clairvoyance or clairaudience, a person is seen or heard, who is known to be dead, the experience is of a face and a body or a voice that answers to our sensory experience of the person when he was alive. As such, its significance is limited to that of our sensory apparatus, of which it might be considered an extension. The mystical, on the other hand, has to do with relations between things sensed, with meanings, values, and discriminations between more real and less real. In its simplest manifestations, it is an instrument in the service of quality of life. 
It is the subtlest and yet the most exact and surest instrument by which a man can affect a sound and masterful orientation both to the world in which he lives and to the universe. It is not at the service of the personal ego. It serves best the man who is willing to succumb in an effort to create beyond himself. This leads directly to the other distinction I want to make here. The appearance of psychic powers is morally quite unconditioned. Clairvoyance, clairaudience, mental telepathy, mediumship, and the like appear in people of no spiritual aspiration or moral earnestness whatever. The woman who, as a medium, wrote the book entitled The Sorry Tale was, I am informed by a man who knew her, a mere social butterfly. The mystical, on the other hand, usually, if not always, and without any exception in the case of the best exemplars, supervenes only upon a long moral struggle in which, at last, a man has so exhausted all his resources that unless he find the light and strength by which to effect a new synthesis on a higher level, he must go under. It is the necessary more for the man who already has faithfully used all his powers thus far developed. The psychic, on the other hand, may come to a man whose life has been without moral effort. It is morally and spiritually colorless. It comes neither as a sign that one has moral capacity, nor as a reward for having put one's capacity to a faithful use. From the point of view of quality of life, it has no meaning whatever. The mystical, however, is the very quick of such life. But though I would thus set the mystical sharply apart from the psychic, I would maintain that there is nothing worthy of the name spiritual or religious that does not have the mystical at its heart. A man may be ever so moral and idealistic, but if he is not at least somewhat mystical, I should deny that he could be really spiritual at all. And likewise of religious. We too readily forget what, after all, is historically demonstrable that every great religion has taken its departure from the mystical experience of some great man. And if we now use the words religious to apply to the manifold forms into which the burning eruption of his life has finally cooled and set dead scoria of ritual and ceremony of meetings, readings, prayings, bendings of the knee and head, then we should have some other word to apply to the experience of the great seers. For those forms belong to the life of those who do not have eyes, who do not have ears, who are incapable of what I should call real religion. What we should never forget is that the lion-hearted leaders of the pious-hearted sheep live totally by different principles. But in any case, the mystical belongs to the experience of the leaders, the great spiritual originators, and no less to the experience of all those who undertake to press after them. Large things are often claimed for the mystical experience of these great ones. Some of these I like, some I do not. Some of them I believe, and some I simply cannot. I do not believe that any mystic's experience, whether that of Jesus, Buddha, or any other, was ever a matter of a conscious union with a living absolute, to use a definition of Evelyn Underhill, a popular authority on mysticism, or that it was any science of ultimates, to use another, or that in the mystic touched the substantial being of deity, not merely its manifestation in life, to use still a third. I believe it is not given to man to reach any absolutes, or ultimates. The emotional tone of an experience is no necessary indication of its profundity. The substantial being of deity has never been experienced by any man. Every minute, on every side, I presume that ultimate reality stares every man in the face, and this that we call stick, stone, star, and all the relations of things are only the best that each man, according to his faculties, is able to make of this reality. But no man, not the greatest mystic in his deepest penetration, ever found himself face to face with God, with the unveiled abysmal reality of the universe, but rather with appearances, indeed not the same appearances that flood the consciousness of the ordinary man, but nonetheless face to face with what in the last analysis was the phenomenal world, appearances. Beyond this, 
it never has been possible for man to go. Likely, to face reality nakedly would destroy us. Again, I resist strenuously the talk common amongst mystics, Hindus and Muslims, Sufis, for example, about the absorption of the individual in God, in the Absolute, in the Universal All and the like. For them, individual existence is illusory, and the aim of one's life is to lose one's identity, to escape from individual existence. Even Walt Whitman talks about merging, and seems fond of the phrase en masse, though this was probably a survival from his reading of Oriental literature without his realizing the inconsistency of such phrases with the thoroughgoing individualism of his own makeup. Now it is one thing, and for me, not only all right, but even necessary for fulfillment and elevation of life, to have sympathy for other creatures, and at last, a sense of unity in which one perceives that everything and everybody without exception in the whole universe is an extension of one's own self. I rejoice in a self of unity that makes us feel one with all people and all things, somewhat as the continents and mid-sea islands run deep down under the ocean and become one in the earth. Yet this particular kind of unity does not alter the fact or the recognition of the fact that some are big and others little, that some are high while others are comparatively low. In this kind of unity, there is no loss of identity, no confusion of function, no illusion of equality, and only in this way can I apply the idea to humans. I am willing enough to become one with God if these absorption mystics want me to, and if by that they mean become at one with the source of all life, and especially if they mean integrated with the deepest springs of my own being. But if they begin trying to efface the hard, wiry line, Blake, that determines, at least for practical purposes, where my individual personality begins and ends, even as my skin determines where my body begins and ends, then I am ready to fight, and to become as ugly as may prove necessary in order to hold off this living death. And Blake, and Nietzsche at least, were two mystics who felt the same way. I should say that Jesus was another. What were all his hard sayings, but the result of a struggle to keep other people, near and dear people, all the more because they were soft and softening, lending themselves easily to merging, from absorbing his life into theirs. And yet I can assure my reader that I do not like any better a mysticism that involves a settled isolation from the world. For some few people, perhaps this is all right. I do not like to dogmatize about life. And for many people, for a period, while they seek to tap their deepest levels, yes. For great things are done when men and mountains meet. This is not done by jostling in the street, Blake. And it is said of Jesus, the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. For the time being, he was incapacitated for carrying on the ordinary work of life. Again and again, he retired to the solitary places for a breathing spell, for a chance to make sure of his bearings and his course, and to drink from the deeper springs within him. But, with all that accomplished, he went back to where the people were, for the yeast is not on the pantry shelf, but in the dough. And the true seers are leaven, leaven, ferment, light, and flaming sword. Nearly always, they have to struggle to find some effective way to reach the life of the people. They speak, they write, they do, but they refuse to run away from life. Nor, finally, do I like the desirelessness so often held up as the aim of the mystic's aspiration especially perhaps among Hindus. For without desire, nothing moves. One could not move even towards desirelessness except by desire. And when one reached desirelessness, one would not be far from dead. Desire for desirelessness is, at bottom, desire for death. And as such, it is evidence of decadence, evidence that life is weary, beaten, poisoned, and has turned against itself. The aim should never be desirelessness, but rather the recognition of one's dominant desire as the core of one's being, 
one center of potential integration. And with this, the effort to subordinate every other desire to that one. Desirelessness leads to a kind of general emaciation, whereas the effort to make one's dominant desire regnant leads to an integration of force and to an increase of effective power. Having thus disposed of some of the current conceptions of the mystical that I find more or less unacceptable, I may now, on the positive side, attempt a definition of my own. The mystical, for me, is a matter of an added sensitiveness to relations and values, such that one is suddenly aware of what a body of ascertained facts adds up to in the realm of truth, or of its significance in the world of values, whether for oneself or for society, or both. Moreover, it is a means for integrating the truth that one has become aware of with life, with one's own life, a revelation of what one must do about truth. Thereafter, it becomes impossible to be one who merely plays with ideas and bandies words about after the matter of the modern intellectual. Thought, moral imperatives, and action are brought together to form a unified whole. One cannot stop short with thinking. One must do something about what one thinks. And thus, one grows steadily into the independence and self-reliance, the sure vision, the inner harmony, and the quiet strength of the fully integrated personality. If I am right in this, then anyone can see that the mystical, even in its more rudimentary manifestations, must commonly prove to be an inestimable aid to making sure of one's course in life and to find strength to follow it. And on its higher levels, as we shall see in a later chapter, it may come to its consummation in what is no less than a different order of consciousness. In its effects, we may say that it is like the acquisition of a new faculty of perception. In its development, it is as though we were experiencing the evolution of an inner I. At the beginning, there is only, as it were, a sensitive spot, able to distinguish between night and day. But gradually, as we use this sensitiveness, we find that it increases. It becomes subtly sensitive not only, let us say, to a wider range of gradations of light, but to color, and to even more exquisite shades of difference in color. And with ever-increasing sharpness of definition, the sensitive spot has become a full-grown and perfected eye. On its emotional side, the experience is accompanied from the very first appearance of this sensitiveness, even in its more elementary forms, with a feeling of elation, as over the recognition that the life within us is expanding, reaching, pushing out to the more effective mastery of our environment. And there is the wistful, more or less awe-filled apprehension that behind this sensitiveness lies life in new fullness and meaning, that this sensitiveness is to be trusted and followed, and that in one's fateful way, one's destiny is hinging on whether one does trust it or not. And if one does trust it, there follows, I think always, on any level at which this sensitiveness may make its appeal, a feeling of exaltation and of joy. This is due partly to the mastery of the fears and other weaknesses that have been holding one back, partly to the new feeling of freedom from division and the consequent greater inner ease and increased possibilities of concentrated force. But what the experience is treasured for is not good feeling of it, but for the new light on one's way and for the new power to follow that way and do things on it. In fact, so determining has been the effect of the mystical experience of the world's greatest seers, with whom it has been no less than I have called a new order of consciousness, that I am convinced that this alone can adequately explain their difficulties, their performance, their power, and their social significance. And this may become more obvious when I begin to examine the mystical experience in the light of psychology, but I think that probably for many people, there is no way in which I can throw more light on its nature and on how it starts and on what it may lead to than by telling how I myself, 
from rather rationalistic beginnings, came to be somewhat mystical. My own mystical experience has its origin in, and I think has always been chiefly, what perhaps might be called the pocket compass variety. That is, it seems that with me, it usually has had an immediate and practical bearing. It has been, first of all, a means of getting my bearings on a dark night, of knowing which way to go when the path forked, and of tapping undiscovered resources within me at times of crisis. But my mystical bent was late in showing itself. I grew up in a fundamentalist Presbyterian home, and the Presbyterians, of course, have always had a strongly rationalistic tradition. So it was natural when at the age of 28, I came to the drastic break I then made with my own past and current practice that I did not trust myself to embark upon so momentous a venture until I had set down in black and white just what I was going to do and all my reasons for it. Throughout much of the following year, I was very busy, Tolstoy-like, in providing a rational basis and justification for each of my departures from conventional ethics and practice. But it happened that through the first year, which was one of ceaseless inner conflict, I was closely associated with a young Quakeress. And of course, the Quakers have the opposed mystical tradition. One evening, she said to me, Bill, you go at things so hard. You sort of chew your way through everything. But I think there is a more natural way. Sometime, when you have a decision to make, why don't you try simply to be utterly still inside? And in that stillness, absolutely willing to go any way. And see if you don't just know what you should do. And so a few nights later, having a small decision to make, and perhaps with all the more readiness because the decision was not of any great moment, I tried what she had said. And I had found that it was even as she had assured me it would be. As soon as I was genuinely willing to go any way whatever, I somehow knew what I should do. And this way of getting a sense of direction was indeed so simple, and by all the tests of subsequent experience proved so sound and satisfying, that I gradually got into the habit of making all my decisions thus. And there are two observations on my subsequent experience that I feel I should make. Through over 20 years of making decisions in this way, I believe that never once when confronted with the necessity of choice have I become utterly still inside without being given a clear realization of what I should do. My emotions might be so beyond my control that it would take me months to reach that state of utter willingness, but once it was reached, there always came a crystal clear sense of what the answer for me was. I believe that the chief reason most people have difficulty in reaching a decision is in the strength of their uncoordinated emotions. They have a canny sense of where their deepest life wants to go, or where they would find themselves inwardly commanded to go if they stopped resisting, but the focus of the desires with which they have identified themselves does not want to go that way, is afraid to go that way, demands things that simply do not fit in with going that way. So this focus of desires with which they have identified themselves, this mutinous self, resists, fights, argues, refuses, and runs for its life. And yet, if finally, in one way or another, all these desires and fears are brought to stillness, and if in all the depths of one's being is no longer afraid of anything whatever, and is no longer hanging on to anything or trying to get anything for oneself, not security, nor anyone's respect or love or companionship, not influence or name or one's own peace, if at last one is genuinely and to one's very depths able to accept and to rest in what one really is, then there is always only one thing that one should do. I never have known it to fail. The second observation that I want to make is this. In these 20 odd years, I have had to make decisions that cut into the very bone, not only of my own life, but of the lives of other people very near and dear to me. But I feel as I look back, that not once in all these years have I made a decision in this way that I now have reason to regret. And this, I submit, is a severe test. Not, of course, that everything I did, say, ten years ago, 
I should do still. I haven't lived 10 years for nothing. But taking into account the fact that none of us can escape himself, that each of us, if he begins at all, must begin where he is, taking into account my whole past that lay before any particular decision, the kind of ancestors, parents, and home that I had, the kind of schools that I had gone to and the books that I had read, the whole course of experience that had made me what I was at the moment. I feel that through this means that I have been describing, I got the next steps for the day and the morrow and each other morrow as it followed, by which I might most quickly slough off all the extraneous elements that I had picked up in my past and most quickly and surely come to the freeing of what I really was. Not that I have arrived, I have not, but despite all the handicaps and limitations under which I have had to live, it has brought me so much that if I were to die now, I should feel that life had been good and eminently rich of growth and fulfillment and could call heartily for its repetition. As for those to whom the way I went brought pain, I cannot be so sure but I was not the only one who saw the spirit in my father and mother so broadening and deepening that the time came when it seemed that there was nothing that I should probably ever have to do that would take me beyond the reach of their love. And the person who perhaps suffered most under the course that I followed once came to me years afterward and said, Bill, I thank God for everything you have put me through. I see now that the way you have gone has meant increased life for me just as surely as for yourself. All this, of course, helped greatly to sustain my faith in that which I spoke within me. Such an attitude must be understood, or one can have no patience with it. Let us suppose, therefore, that I am at this moment confronted with the necessity of a decision, and try to take my reader into it with me. If it be a problem involving some situation in society, such as education, the problem of the machine, the differential birth rate, or the consequences of crossing people of very different races, then it behooves me to gain just as full and accurate a knowledge of all the relevant facts as I am capable of getting. For that which speaks within me in my deepest stillness is not something that speaks out of the blue. It is rather like a lantern that is passed over the field of my knowledge, and what it will reveal will depend in part upon what I know. It is important, therefore, that I know much. To this end, I must enlist every body of human knowledge that bears on my problem, biology, anthropology, sociology, history, and the like. Also, with what critical faculty I have, I will undertake to analyze the situation in which I must act, pick it to pieces, grasp the relation of its parts, and single out the different ways by which I might go from where I am. But when it comes to the actual choice of the way I shall go, then I try to stop thinking altogether. My whole task is narrowed down to an effort to be willing to go any way whatever. I try to put my emotions quite aside, to prevent any least fear or desire from putting any cast in my eye. I try to stand outside myself and to look at the situation as though I were another man. I seek to watch which way the current of life in me presses as coldly as I might look to see which way the tide is flowing. Thus I produce within my consciousness, as it were, a blank sheet for life to write what it will. This utter willingness to go any way whatever creates within me a vast stillness that settles down into my very depths. And in that stillness, there is that within me that draws very near and speaks to me. It is not a voice that I can hear with my outer ears, but it is more real and more commanding than any voice I ever did hear with my outer ears. And what it says to me is no abstraction or generalization. It is not even a word that is equally for all other times in my own life. It is a word that is spoken to me for that one moment. And what it says is very concrete and explicit, seeming to take into account all the actualities of the situation before me, my father, mother, wife, child, security, name, influence, everything. It says to me, now you do this. And from that moment, the whole question of whether life in me increases or decreases, rises in quality or falls, 
moves towards integration or dissipation and dispersion depends upon whether or not I can be child enough to obey. One may wonder what would ever be able to reduce a person to such openness, willingness, and obedience. I believe there is nothing that will prove equal to it except love. I do not mean that soft, suffocating thing that I might call lovingness. Love, for me, must have direction and edge. In this case, it is love for quality of life, which is as much quality of life for all men as it is for oneself, in serving in which one feels one rises above one's own personal self and identifies one's own life with the highest good of the race. For this, one is willing to live on or to perish. And to this love, this utter devotion to advance in the life of the race, one is ready to sacrifice one's neighbor with oneself. And yet I do not claim for what may speak within a man that it is anything either absolute or infallible. For me, it represents only the greatest wisdom about life that is capable of reaching his consciousness at any one time. I regard it as being, in effect at least, a synthesis of all his highest perceptive faculties. There is no way open to him by which he can improve on the sense of direction that he gets thus. But though I believe that this core of what I am is neither absolute, nor infallible, nor a metaphysical god, nor even the voice of such a god, still I would undertake to give it as implicit acceptance and obedience as if it were, verily, an absolute and infallible God, simply because these felt interior commands, as Whitman called them, represent the only firm and solid ground by which we can crawl out of the quicksand in which we were born. There are only footsteps to the sureness of oneself that alone offers a rock, rising impregnable above the rushing waters of human existence, upon which we can build a house that will stand, he who trifles with himself is lost. He who is true to himself only when it is safe, respectable, expedient, effective, or reasonable to do so, will find sooner or later that life has left him to go to one who will be more faithful. The old seers, many of them, may have lacked the psychological understanding of themselves on which we are prone to pride ourselves today, but their instinct for life did not betray them. Possibly, we have more understanding than they did, but we are certainly less alive. The very touch of most of us is death. They knew that what spoke and moved within them in the deepest stillness of their beings was life, and that whether or not you called it God, it was a jealous master. In our moment of deepest stillness is delivered to us what we must do if we really want to live, and really to live means to become ever more alive. One can never stand still. You advance or you recede. You become more sensitive or you begin to harden and dry up. And somehow the flow of sap is stopped. The electric current is broken if a man departs by so much as a hair's breadth from what he is commanded to do. Thus, certainly, it always has been with me. Probably this is because the very spirit of the thing the circuit itself, is one's attitude toward the interior command. If you accept it and trust it and obey it, like a child or like a soldier under orders, then you are one with it, and the force flows all through you. But if you doubt and talk back and argue and require reasons and seek to improve on the commands by taking counsel from worldly wisdom, then your very doubt and resistance break the circuit. All my experience confirms this. Perhaps there is no way in which I can so make people understand with what literalness I mean every word that I am saying as by an incident out of my own life. It was Christmas time in the winter of 1924. I was living in a small, hardly weatherproof shanty in the backyard of a Polish fellow whose house I had helped to build. I knew that in Central Europe, as a result of dire poverty in which the people had been left by the war, there were thousands, even of women and children, who had to walk the ice and snow barefooted. All about me, warmly clad people were thronging the stores 
to buy mostly superfluous Christmas presents, and on Sundays were gathering in the churches to talk about God and love and brotherhood. But all I could see was the rich man who feasted while Lazarus died of hunger at his back gate. Yet I do not recall that I had made any conscious problem of what I should do about the situation. It came to the last Sunday before Christmas. I was in my shanty with some strange restlessness upon me, some pain of inner compression, as from something swollen within me that wanted to be born. In vain, I tried to read or write. At last, I put all such things aside and gave myself over to an effort to be inwardly quiet enough to find out what it meant. And then, in the inner stillness that finally ensued, and to my utter consternation, a voice in me said, Take off your shoes and walk barefoot to the center of Passaic, about a mile and a half, and there cry to the people in the name of love. There was a long pause, and then I replied, I cannot, and my mind was quick to furnish me with the reasons why I could not. My feet will freeze and they will develop gangrene so that I shall lose them. And just how will that help anyone? And I saw my mother, who never heard voices like these. I foresaw all the anguish such a step would cause her, and I said again, I cannot do it. And I saw, too, the effect that such a step would have on people's confidence in me. And I said, if I do this, people will think I am crazy, and they'll no longer take me seriously in regard to anything. This step looked to me dangerously near the irrational, and I was anxious to prove myself, for all my extremes in some directions, essentially well-balanced. Probably hours passed, the voice commanding and I resisting and arguing, until at last I came to what I believed my final answer. No, I cannot. I will not. And yet, I was left heartsick, with that heartsickness that always overtook me whenever I had not done what I had been commanded to do. And I soon discovered that the struggle was not over. I had to leave town to fight it out. It was bitter, and there was no quarter. After some days, I knew that this step I must take, or spiritually, I would die. So far, at least from 1920 on, when confronted with a crisis like this, I had never yet refused to obey, and I felt that this time also I must obey, or I would break my contact with life. At last I saw that what I was commanded to do was nothing impossible. To take off my shoes and walk in the snow the mile and a half to the center of Passaic, there to cry to the people in the name of love, was perfectly possible if only I could rise above my fear of the consequences. And presently it came over me that the situation in the world being what it was, and I being the kind of man that I was, there was something in me that even wanted to do it. And finally, I knew that I was going to do it. On the afternoon of the last day before New Year's, I went back to my shanty to do what I had been commanded. I took off my shoes and socks, stepped quietly out of my shanty door into the snow, and with my eyes fixed on the ground all the way, walked the one and a half miles to the center of Passaic, and there cried to the people in the name of love. Within a few minutes, before I was through speaking, I was arrested on a charge of insanity. I saw the new year begin behind cell bars. The next morning, in a very quiet courtroom, a judge listened to what I had to say, and to a few friends who had quickly rallied in my defense. At last, though I explained that I could not put on my shoes and why, the judge said, this is a very unusual case, I dismiss it, and I returned barefooted to my shanty. Well. And what do you think you accomplish by doing all that? The efficiency-minded American will be sure to ask. That, however, was not the primary question with me then, and it is not now. There are things in life that are worthwhile, even though they have no practical utility, whatever. And this was a step that I never could have taken had I not been able to accept the possibility that there will be no effects at all. The whole thing might be as irrational as it then seemed, but in fact, the reason which just then I had to leave behind one of the few times in my life when I have finally overtook me to give, in the end, the blessing that it had withheld in the beginning. The step did have its effect, albeit a small one, 
even for the suffering people of Europe. Yet I am quite willing to concede that the effects of primary consequence were those that took place in myself, and about these there is no reason. Renan, as I recall, says somewhere in his Life of Jesus that no man shall come to complete freedom of soul until he has attained a supreme indifference to what men think of him. And this was the more necessary in me because I cared too much for the good opinion of my fellows. But it was more than this that had to go underfoot before I could do such a thing. My concern for my mother had to step down from any first place, and the desire of reason to dominate my life likewise, and no less my fear of physical suffering, of what might even prove physically disastrous. If ever a man is to become whole, so that wherever he goes, all of him goes, and wherever he hits, he hits with every bit of his strength he has, it is necessary that there should come to be in him just one recognized master, and that every recalcitrant element in him, every potentially mutinous center, should either have been passed under the yoke and taught to obey, or else be caught so up under the spell of the master that it voluntarily enlists. There cannot be two masters. And this task of getting one master recognized may be a bloody business. For every one of these intransigent elements is alive and resists subjugation as every living thing resists death. It will fight like a man, like a woman, like a child, like an animal. It fights to win, and it will win any way it can. It has no principles, no scruples, and no heart. It will attack, it will argue, it will plead, it will seduce, any way that will work so that a man's one-ing is one of the hugest tasks that he ever essays, and the victory here the greatest that he ever can win. And perhaps my reader will now see, without my saying any more about it, that before I could do this thing that was required of me, a good many of the most dangerous centers of rebellion in me had to surrender, at least for this one round. When I took this step, I went a long way toward becoming an undivided whole. I was nearer than I had ever been before to having one center from which I took orders. And by this alone, even though the step had accomplished nothing for the sufferers abroad, I believe it was entirely justified. But this realization came wholly in retrospect. At that time, at least, to have done such a thing for the sake of my own wanting would have been impossible. A step had to be unselfish to be justified. I did not then have enough psychological insight to appreciate that no man can do anything, whatever, except for the sake of some kind, to increase his own life. I did not have large enough comprehension to see that there is a holy and hallowing selfishness, men have blessed and sanctioned it by calling it God, that is as far removed from all the petty meanness of what ordinarily passes for selfishness as is day from night and which, from all its impulses, originate in the individual, is yet bent upon blessing mankind and will pursue that end, though it destroy the individual from whose heart it sprang. Nor did I then have the strength to shoulder the full responsibility of doing everything avowedly for the sake of that kind of selfishness, that high and holy blessing and blessed kind. I did not then dare say, I do this because... From the core of my being I was made to do it, and I want to do it, and I pronounce this necessity to be a holy necessity, and this wanting a holy wanting. No. At the time, I took the step as an act of supreme devotion to my God. It was not I who wanted to go barefoot, in the winter, in the snow, not at least in my ordinary consciousness. I shrank from it as I might have shrunk from strangling. It was God's will, not mine. I was taking this step for one reason. If I did not, I should have to part company with all that for me was God. To keep him, I should have to give up what then seemed to be everything I had. The price was high, but I had paid it before, parted with what at an earlier time had seemed my all, and I had rejoiced in the eventual results. There had proved to be no sacrifice about it. All my giving up had come to be only a making of room for real things, 
What came to me in consequence was far more than all I had parted with. God was fast becoming all in all to me. I could no more turn from him than a plant can turn from the sun. So, once again, I let him have his way with me. I took off my shoes and walked barefoot to the center of Passaic. And that night, as 1925 came in, I sang there in the Passaic jail as I had never sung before, softly to be sure, but from a heart that danced in purest joy. For my love of my God had been tested, as it were, at the point of a leveled gun, and I had not recanted. Back in 1920, when I had begun my Franciscan venture, I had put my hand in his hand and vowed that come what might, I never would withdraw it. I would go wherever he might lead. I would never turn back. I would draw no line beyond which I should refuse to go. I would stop at nothing. Though he slew me, yet I would trust him. So I had told him, and what I had said I had meant. I had been tested before and had not failed, but this time the test had been much more severe. But still, I hadn't failed. No wonder that my God that night was the nearest thing in all the world. I can well now understand how Jesus, unconsciously interpreting his experience, could call that which spoke within him his Father, or Kabir call it his Beloved. I can understand that all of a sudden they could feel that the universe was a home, a place one could feel unafraid in, a place long prepared through a long absence for their eventual return. I can understand that day and night were for them the heartbeat of their beloved, and year after year his deep rhythmic breathing, and the changes of season, but the changes of vesture in which he came to court their love. I can understand their feeling that there was within them no more division, and therefore no more sense of sin. They no longer resisted their destiny, or attempted to argue with their God. At last, there was no longer left any last vestige of a partition between my will and thy will. I and my Father are one. The hour of the great marriage had come. Amor Fati had arrived. The nucleus of the spiral nebula had gathered all the trailing elements into itself and become a sun. It was the time of the great oneing. On its lower levels than the mystical experience, that is, in its commoner manifestations, is a matter of new sensitiveness in regard to values and therefore to life direction. If this sensitiveness is followed, it tends to lead to the mystical experience in its higher manifestations, where it amounts to a new order of consciousness and admits those who possess it to whole realms of meaning, of beauty, of value, which to those who lack it are utterly closed. Of this last, however, I shall wait to write when I present the psychological significance of the mystical experience. In my next chapter, I will present the checks by which I believe it is important to test the soundness of one's inner leadings, partly to avoid going off at a tangent or wasting one's life up blind alleys, partly to avoid just as much as possible bringing needless suffering into the lives of others. In Chapter 7, I will first develop the higher levels of mystical experience as a matter of the evolution of mankind through a new order of consciousness, and then appraise the whole experience from the point of history and science, particularly of psychology.